Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Lord be with you as we gather in God's house today to be fed with his word and the gift of his sacrament, his body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of sins. May our God strengthen you as we find our hope, our healing, and refreshment in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Follow the order of service is printed in our worship folder. Everything is included within that worship folder. A lot like last week, and yet there's also folks who, are, who were not here last week. And so one of the biggest changes you'll notice is how we'll be at, um, giving communion. It's going to be a continuous format, and you'll be ushered out pew by pew. And uh, we'll start over here in this transept, and you'll walk around and receive the bread and the wine. And you can place them in the receptacle right here. And then we'll do this side of the congregation. You'll be ushered forward. There'll be a pastor here with the bread to place into your hand and a pastor here with the cups to receive those. Please do not feel rushed as you come forward. It's going to kind of have that sense as we walk forward. Please take your time. We're receiving the good gifts of Jesus' body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. I encourage you to take a moment and enjoy what we are receiving. And then when you return to your pew to be able to take a few moments in prayer. After we serve this side of the congregation, the usher will come to this transept where again the pastor will give the bread and the wine. You can place the cup in the receptacle and then we'll go on this half of the congregation. One of the differences that we'll do this week is pastor and I wear masks with that as kind of close contact with people and holding elements and things. And so just out of respect for people, not that we feel like we are sick, um, but just out of the respect of offering God's gifts to you and being closer than well, guidelines say we'll be wearing a mask for that uh, for people who may have those concerns. So we'll relax and we'll enjoy being refreshed in God's house with his word and sacrament. And so let us open as we sing our opening hymn. Number 644, The Church is One Foundation. It's printed on page two of our worship folder. We'll stand for the last stanza as we ask the Lord to bless us this morning in worship.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take a moment of silence for reflection on God's word and self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Victory for our God. Alleluia, 
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our scripture readings. Our scripture readings for this, the fifth Sunday of Easter. The first reading is recorded in Acts chapter 6 and 7, the selected verses. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty that we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. What they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those of Sicilia and Asia, Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? They killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is recorded in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 2. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So you come to him, 
a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to, put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Out of honor and respect for Jesus, let us stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel as we sing. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. to you, oh Lord. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father." Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated as we sing the hymn of the day.
Grace to you and peace from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, mothers, today, happy Mother's Day. Our friends, our guests and visitors here with us this morning, God's peace be with you, and it's good to be with you today. I hope you don't mind if I just take a moment to look around today, to spend a little time just seeing who's here, and there may be some people downstairs that I can't see, obviously, but, uh, you know, it's been a while since we've been in this way. This is our last, second week. Last week we were together, and now this is our second week after quite a long time, and, and uh, it's just good to see you here, and I just want to just take a look at your faces, and, you know, we're going to get together, we're going to talk, we're going to connect as time goes on. You've seen Pastor and me on the computer, maybe, but we haven't seen you. And so it's just good to see you today, and it's wonderful to be together again. Even though we are under those guidelines of social distancing and trying to keep sanitized and all that, well, so be it. We're together, and that's great. And we pray that this will continue to happen. I just thought about it just yesterday. I thought, when was the last time that I actually preached to you in person? It was actually on March the 8th. I counted up nine weeks ago. Now, I should have been here on the 15th, but I had a cough, and it was probably better to stay home that day. But we've been away from church together for quite a while, and so it's just a a special thing to be together. We appreciate the technology we have so that we can make those connections and so forth, but there's nothing like, and we pastors might put it this way, there's nothing like incarnational ministry. Have you heard that before? You get it? Well, we talk about the incarnation. Well, that's what God did. The Word who was with God, the Word who was God, we read in John chapter 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation of Jesus. So God came into our world in the flesh, and it's wonderful to be together in the flesh, face-to-face, person-to-person. When Jesus came into the world in the flesh, and he began his ministry, he was, it was, amazing. It was an amazing, this is God himself with those disciples. He was teaching them, he was preaching, he was healing, he was comforting and guiding, and we see that in our text today. I'd like to focus on the first six verses of John 14, a familiar text for us, I believe. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I would imagine that for most of you, these are familiar words that we've heard this reading before. Usually we hear it at a funeral or a memorial service. I didn't do this, but if we would go back and look in the file of all the funeral services that we've conducted in the last, say, 10 years, that I would imagine that this would be, this gospel reading would have been the majority of the gospels chosen by families during those difficult times. These are words of great comfort as a person is grieving the loss of a loved one who died in the faith because they need to be encouraged and comforted with the truth that Jesus went to prepare a place for them, and there's a place for them in heaven. I like this reading for funerals too to preach on or just to have read because the people who come to those services need to know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so it brings comfort, it brings truth, it brings guidance. And these are the words that we have today before us. 
Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus comforted his disciples with that promise of a place in heaven for them too. Well, what were they troubled about? They weren't grieving a death, maybe kind of like a death. If you had your pew Bibles here today, we could turn to the context. I'm going to read for you from John chapter 13, beginning with verse 33. I'm going to read a couple of verses to show the context here of why Jesus needed to tell them, let not your hearts be troubled. Here's what it says. Little children, Jesus says, Yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now also I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And then he goes on, he goes on to say in verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And then we have Peter making these big promises. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. We're familiar with that, aren't we? So the disciples were troubled because Jesus spoke about how he would leave them. And they were worried about that. And we can understand that. He was going away. He would be separated from them. He would go where they could not follow. But later, they would be together. And that's what he told them. And then he said to them, and you know the way to where I am going. Now, we would think that they would know the way. They should have known the way. They knew Jesus. They knew his teachings. This was toward the end of that three-year ministry of teaching so many things by word and by miracle and example. And they should have known the way to where he is going, but Thomas, good old Thomas, speaks up. We call him Doubting Thomas, right? You know, I'd like to change, change that a little bit based on this reading. I'd like to call him Honest Thomas. Just let's try that on precise. Honest Thomas, he was, he was honest enough to just say, Lord, we do not know where you are going. So how can we know the way? It's an honest question, right? And just like the other time later when he wouldn't believe unless he saw, and we, you heard about that, of course, online. There was a sermon that was recently. But just Jesus treated him with love and patience and respect, and he says to Thomas, in his mercy, he gives him clear direction to that question. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus says. Don't we need this comforting word of our Lord too? We are here in church for the second time after weeks of being away. The COVID-19 pandemic hasn't gone away yet. In fact, there's some worries right now that as social distancing goes away and as stores open up, there might be a wave. And as we read the history of the 1918 Spanish flu, there were three waves in that one. So we're not over it yet. There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of people getting infected. There are people who are dying. There are people who are fearful of getting affected, those who are in those particular vulnerable spots. And yet, while people are worried or untroubled or, or are troubled, they need the comfort of God's Word. And of course, God's Word has the power, like nothing else in the world, to comfort our hearts and to calm our fears. And Jesus gives that Word to us. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He's saying, trust in God. Trust in me. You know, Jesus is not dividing the deity into two gods. In the gospel reading for today, there's a dramatic teaching that touches on this. Right after he spoke those words in verse 6, and then verse 7, it goes on, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. 
And then Jesus says this, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Interesting. The Scriptures teach us that there is one God, but the Scriptures also reveal to us that God is revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We take that for granted. We can't fully understand it, but God's Word teaches that. And we grasp it by faith as God helps us to believe His Word. Jesus is saying, trust God. Trust me. You're, you're trust, there's not three gods, two gods. There's one God. Believe my promises. And he promises heaven to us. He's about to leave his disciples to prepare a place for them in heaven. And the way he would prepare the place, of course, was to go to his suffering, his death, the payment for the sins of everybody, and his resurrection. And he will also take us to be with him in heaven. And he gives us clear direction. I think we all have this verse memorized. Let's say it together. Verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Good. We need to keep that in mind. We need to hold to that truth that Jesus gives because we live in a world that doesn't teach what Jesus teaches. The world says there's many ways to the Father, many ways to heaven. All roads, all roads lead to heaven, they might say, or they might say all religions are the same. I don't know how somebody can say that, but they do. If you look at the religions, you'd know they're not the same, but they say all religions are the same. It's all the same stuff. It's all one God. Everybody's believing the one God, even though he's got different names. We've heard all that kind of stuff before. We've heard people say it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Well, we want to be sincerely right and believe the truth. In fact, the world would say that by the very words of Jesus here in this text, that Jesus is making it harder for people to get to heaven. He's too exclusive. He's too narrow. And if they're really sharp, they might even point to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where Jesus says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it by it are many, and then verse 14, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. And the world would say, see, Jesus is trying to keep people out of heaven. They don't understand that Jesus wants us to pay attention to what he's saying. And as we pay attention to what he says in Revelation, we know that there are so many people going to be in heaven, you can't even count them all. That's because of the grace of God. Is Jesus trying to make it hard for people? Really? Jesus who came into the world to seek and to save the lost, he's making it hard? Jesus who loved the world so much that he came to die for the sins of everyone, he came to take the punishment that we all deserve for our sins, he took it upon himself, he wants it to be hard for us? No. He wants us to be there. Can't you see? that this exclusive, specific directions of Jesus are given to us so that we don't miss out on heaven. The narrow way is Jesus. The right way is our Lord Christ who suffered for us. The sure and confident way is our Lord because he did it all. He lived a perfect life for us. He died a perfect death for us. He paid the full price. And the resurrection of our Savior that we celebrate in this Easter season is proof and proof positive that everything he said is true and we can count on him for that joy of heaven that he promises all of us in him. The world may say that there are many ways to heaven, but Jesus shows us the comforting truth that I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In these last number of weeks, I don't know, maybe you've discovered that the world affects us, that it's easy to be affected by the world. What I mean by that is that 
I know a lot of you have kept connection. You've watched us online, Pastor and I, trying to bring God's word to you through a distance. It was difficult for us. It was awkward for us. But as we talked with you on the phone and as we heard feedback, you appreciated that. And some of you were blessed by that. And others didn't listen. And that was okay. I'm not trying to shame anybody. But the point is, is that during this time where we haven't been together, we've been kind of, we had to work harder to get connected. Have you noticed that the world doesn't feed your faith? It distracts from it. The world has a way of eroding our trust in the Lord. The world has a way of feeding our fears and inflating our worries. It doesn't comfort us with the truth of Jesus. Have you noticed that? And so it's sometimes we have to be, well, we have to be aware that the world can affect us negatively in our relationship with the Lord. And so how important it is for us to continue with the Lord's word and sacrament. And when we can't be in church, then we can read his word and stay close to him in prayer and fellowship with fellow Christians because we can start thinking like the world thinks so easily and miss the point of the way to heaven. We should know the way, and we do, but we can lose that. Even in normal times, our church body has conducted surveys over the years uh, about people's faith and what they believe, and sadly, in Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, when we've done this, we've always found that there's been about 40, maybe 50 percent of the people who think that there are other ways to heaven besides Jesus. And they write it down on their answer that if you're a good person, that's going to be good enough. If you are sincere, if you're honest, if you're kind, that'll merit heaven. But those things fall short. They're not good enough. We need a Savior. We need a perfect Savior whom we have in our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ. His goodness and mercy, his perfect life given for us, gives us the assurance of that we are on the way to heaven and we have it as God's gift. So praise God for his word and spirit. And may that continue among us. Oh, there's one more thing I have to talk about today. And it's not perfunctory either. It's about moms. Today is Mother's Day. And not being a mother, I can't really speak for moms, but I can speak about moms, and I'm thankful that I have my mom still. That my, the last trip I made was the last plane trip I made was to go see my mother uh, for her birthday, her 90th birthday. It was at the end of February we went, and her birthday's on March the 2nd. I'm going to call her today. She's in the care home. She's in a nursing, well, not really a nursing home. She's in a retirement home, and she can't see any of the siblings, my siblings right now, but we talked to her on the phone. But I'm going to go out on a limb, and moms, you can check me later if you disagree with what I'm going to say, but I want to say this. More than the fact that moms want to be recognized with cards and flowers and phone calls and gifts and candy and all those wonderful things and conversations about those stories of the past and more than all of those wonderful things, here's what mothers want the most. I'm going out on a limb. Every Christian mother, I say every Christian mother, wants nothing more than what they want the most is that their children know the way. That they trust that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So that when they get to heaven, they'll be with those children they love so incredibly much. That's what's most important. The other stuff doesn't really matter in the scheme of eternity. And so, moms, bless you as you continue to love your children, as you witness to them, as you pray for them. And children, God bless you that you would know the way. And I'm talking about all of us, that we would know the way. And it's Jesus, our Savior, our risen Lord. In his name, amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please stand. We join together in confessing our faith.
In the words of the Nicene Creed, it's printed on page 8 in the worship folder. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for prayer. In our prayers this morning, we pray for those with cancer concerns of various kinds, for Sharla Aron, Lori Bauer, J.R. Bruin, Chuck Godfrey, a former member of Trinity who's been diagnosed with cancer, Ken Hale, Peter Janik, Karyana Janguji, Colleen Lynn, Josh Menarek, Rhea Rousset, Jamie Shaw, Lori Smith, Amy Walter, Kevin Worth. We also pray for those with health concerns of various kinds for Katie Cardillo, Britton Collier, Wendy Davis, <coughs> Betty Flexig, Brittany Hatzel, Alberta Hoffaber, June Kazarian, Ted and Irene Kinzel and their caregiver Sue Fashini, Daryl Cobelt, Carol Kober, Saul Kober, Tammy Larson, who has been receiving treatment in Denver now, for Kinsley Murray, Pat Stricker, Ed Wegner, and Darlene Zimmerman. Darlene is in the hospital with pneumonia. We also pray for the family and friends of Michael Munsell, who died last week on Friday. He took his own life. And so we pray for his family, especially his parents, Neil and Carolyn. The service will be scheduled later after his sister can return home from Chile, where they live six months of the year. We also pray for Melissa Keibel and Roger Knuckles, who were married here yesterday, and ask for God's blessings on their marriage. So let us turn to the Lord in prayer. Almighty Father, you have a house with many rooms, and your son Jesus has promised that he is going there to prepare a place for us. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, that we may trust in your word and follow your son, our Savior Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, by Jesus' death and resurrection, you have made us your chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation that has been called out of the darkness of sin and into your marvelous light. Bless your church with the proclamation of your word, that your people may continue to live lives of faithfulness as they trust in your son Jesus and reflect the light of his life. Bless the work of missionaries, church workers, and all who proclaim your word. Use each of us in our vocations at home and at work to share your word with people in our lives that they may know and come to faith in your son Jesus Lord in your mercy hear our prayer Almighty God 
Bless our president, the Congress of these United States, and our governor, and all elected and appointed civil servants so that they may honor you in your purpose, establishing order and justice, encouraging virtue, and protecting all life. Give them wisdom, not only in the face of this pandemic, but in all of their leadership, that their decisions may be for the well-being of the nation and the communities they serve. Continue to use and protect all who serve in the armed forces and emergency personnel as they serve to protect us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, you have compassion on the sick and those in need, and you have promised not to ignore them in their suffering, but to be with them to the very end of the age. Stop the pandemic that is affecting lives around the world and causing such suffering. Protect all medical workers and family members who are serving to provide care to people who are sick and hurting. Lord, we ask that you'd bring healing to the sick and to all who suffer, especially to those we have named before you and those whom we name silently in our hearts and minds. Father, we ask for your healing in accordance with your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you have established the home and blessed those who show us your love. For the gift of mothers and all that they do for the well-being and raising of their children, thank you, Lord. Bless all mothers and the children in their care, that your love may be shown and experienced. Bless all families and make their homes places of love, peace, security, where your word is spoken and forgiveness is freely given. Lord, we give you thanks for the marriage of Melissa and Roger here yesterday. May you bless their marriage and their life at home, that they may give glory to you. So we ask that you use our lives to bring you glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you, God, for your goodness in hearing the prayers of your people and granting us confidence to approach your throne of mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us stand as we follow the service of this sacrament as printed on page 8 of our worship folder. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and beneficial that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death. And by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in. 
Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for your forgiveness. 